the governor's new budget, and the future of higher education in Pennsylvania, next on Behind the Headlines. This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to a new edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. And I'm joined, as usual, by my associate, Maura Donnelly, from Susquehanna Valley Center. Uh, thank you, Maura, for, for joining me again. Hello, Charlie. Hi. Uh, well, I think today we want to talk about one of the biggest areas in um, Governor Corbett's new budget. Yes. And uh, certainly... One of the biggest cuts. Yes. yes. <laughs> certainly the big areas have constantly been uh, corrections and transportation and welfare and education, yes. specifically higher education. Uh, last year we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the um, budget in regard to higher education and it looks like we're going to have to do it again more. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And we have the best person, I think, in Pennsylvania to talk to uh, about that particular proposed budget, and that is Steve Hicks, the president of ABSCUF. Steve, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. As the president of the faculty union that represents the uh, faculty at the 14 state system schools, um, what does this budget look like uh, to you? Well, Charlie, let me let me uh, put the budget. Just a general, let, general. Let's start overview. by talking in terms of context. Uh, the governor's budget, which came out, you know, his address was two weeks ago, and what he said in that budget, and most of the predictions ahead of time indicated this. Uh, the 2012-13 budget, slightly smaller even than the 11-12 budget. Yes. And when you hear that, when you're one of the constituents expecting money from the Commonwealth, you, you recognize that that's not a good thing because that, you know, even in the modest inflationary growth we've had, you know, let's talk 2%, which is, I think is roughly about where we are. If the, the budget shrinking, you're not growing that 2%, you're not right. keeping up with expenses. So that means somebody's going to end up uh, taking some sort of cut. Uh, so uh, that, that's part of the context. And within that context, he came out and cut higher education, uh, various places, various different numbers. But one, one number, the number that's important to uh, the faculty and students of the state system schools is he cut us 20%, which is about $83 million. He also cut the uh, state related, so that's Penn State, Pitt, and Temple 30%. And, uh, Nobody's explained it to me yet, but Lincoln University, which is a four state related, did not take a cut at all. No one's but explained that to you. I haven't I haven't heard the, I have so not heard the explanation as to why Lincoln uh, We were wondering the same thing. It's perplexing. Right. It, 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 it is well, it, it's probably one of those interesting <laughs> sidebar stories somebody will write at some point. Uh, and the uh, third part of the puzzle is FIA, which provides grants to those who uh, need the money in the state. Uh, took a about six percent cut. Uh, one of the things to remember in terms of where we are as a commonwealth is the governor only a month ago asked for uh, mid-year adjustments and depending on what word you want to use, uh, I, I think the word freeze probably works best for people. There are technical terms, but uh, we were asked at the state system to do a five percent freeze. So was FIA. Uh, the state system, uh, the state related is all don't get asked because of the arrangement and the way, the, as you know, the architecture of the of the state. Uh, they don't get asked, they get it taken back by the governor. So they lost 5% in January. Um, FIA, FIA's board voted and said that they're only giving back a little over 3%, that they couldn't give the whole 5%. And the uh, state system board, uh, well, they met in January after the governor's request and said they they needed more time to look into things, and they haven't made a decision yet what to do with the 5%. Yeah. Uh, there, is a, there is some historical memory of the early 90s when Bob Casey was yes. governor, and he asked for a similar amount yes. back, and the board voted definitively and unanimously. Well, it wasn't quite unanimous, but uh, definitively said, no, we're not giving yeah. it back. Remember that. Uh, the flip side of that was <laughs> Governor Casey then took it out of the next several budgets by um, reducing uh, their budget. So 
Uh, we've taken big, big hits here in the last uh, year. Well, yeah, you, let's talk about that. I mean, this is on the heels of last year being a pretty significant reduction. Right. Well, the governor. Let's start with the fact the governor started last March in his first budget address uh, by proposing a 54 percent cut to the state right. system. Uh, it was reduced to 18 percent by the time the July 1st budget mm -hmm. actually was passed. That's about 90 million dollars uh, reduction. Uh, the state related took a similar number, and uh, FIA took a, a cut too, a, a small, a small percentage cut. So it's not like uh, the governor here in three um, budgetary addresses and, and, and budgetary moments has gone any gone away from higher ed. But he also hasn't done what he said he was going to do, which is redistribute the money from the institutions to the students. Uh, the, he is not putting more money into the grant program. So um, it's, it's a double dip. Uh, students are taking, are going to see higher tuition and uh, they're not going to see more in terms of their grant from the state. And let's, so let's, uh, we, should, we should remind, I guess, the viewers that what last year the state system had a what, an 18% yeah. cut? Um, 18% cut. So right. now this is another 20% cut proposed on top of that. Well, and, and with the 5% mid-year, mm -hmm. depending upon how that comes out. But it, it, it's getting towards the uh, $200 million number that he's cut or proposed cutting the, the 14 state-owned institutions, which will, you know, I'm an English professor, so matters of definition. Uh, are you state-owned uh, when you are so little funded? By the state, what what is the commitment of uh, the the state when you know the label is state owned and you live under a whole series of rules that say state state owned? So, uh, as we're now, if the governor's proposal goes through, uh, as he put it for two weeks ago, uh, we would be funded less than the state related institutions were when we became a system in 1982. Uh, we would get a smaller percentage from the state than they did then. So you know. Uh, definitions change, obviously, but it raises questions as to um, whether we're really, you know, what what state-owned means and what the obligation is. And you know, these days the, the joke about institutions like uh, like Penn State and several other big research one institutions, public institutions, is that they're not so much state-related as state-located, and and that's mm -hmm. about it, as far as the commitment goes. Uh, well, so it's a it's a it's a big issue, and it's obviously a big policy issue as to where we are in terms of funding well, that, of higher ed. Th this is going to probably require pure speculation on your part, and you're talking about a policy decision. Right. Why do you think the governor uh, continually goes after educational funding as a way of closing the budget gap? Uh, um, well, you know, uh, the governor does not call me an ass, so I, I, I'm obviously... <laughs> That's why I'm it, saying it's pure it, it speculation. Is pure, it, is, it is. I'm uh, sure he's not sharing his, his he's, uh, he's thoughts not, on he, it. No, no I, I, I amazingly don't get the insights uh, you know. to his policy. But let, let me... I, okay, I, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, so I'm not going to go down that road. But in terms of simple um, math in the budget, there are only so many discretionary places he can go on the budget. If your budget is shrinking by even the little bit it's going, there are only a, a limited number of places that you can cut the budget, all right? Education is one of the places that he has discretion, and they cut a billion dollars from K through 12 last year, uh, coming back and trying to cut K through 12, another X, you know, that kind of number. Uh, does not seem so that even narrows him down even more they they tried to do something with uh, public welfare and reduce the public wealth but nobody's clear that that happened last y you know the 400 yes. million dollars they're supposed to do through uh, waste fraud and, and abuse and in that they were going to save nobody's actually sure they've saved it so it's kind of hard to go back mm -hmm. there so I, I think when they sit down and look at you know, our options on, on the discretionary list, I think higher ed is sitting there uh, with, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on the line item, and they, they don't have they other places they're willing mm -hmm. to go. Now, the problem, you know, when we go into policy now, uh, the problem is that pie doesn't have to be shrinking. I mean, they just passed a Marcella Shale 
uh, bill that fees mm -hmm. because it wasn't a tax and the because the governor doesn't do tax. Yeah, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. he doesn't do he doesn't do taxes, but uh, the the size of that fee is smaller than say West Virginia's similar uh, fee. We could have raised more income and we could have uh, had a bill that put some of it into the general fund to grow the general fund. They've also struggled for several years with uh, something called the Delaware loophole where companies don't pay Pennsylvania taxes because they have a, a, an office in, in Delaware where which has no corporate taxes. So that's a, it's a and everybody is aware that there are several hundred million dollars left on the table, but uh, they have not passed the legislation to, to fill that. There are ways to make the pie bigger so you don't have to make these choices and that's those, uh, those decisions have not been made and he's proud of the fact he hasn't raised taxes and um, we, we, we move forward on that. There is, a, of course, the other part of the whole policy discussion. He ran as a governor and I think he did this in uh, contradistinction to Governor Rendell. He wasn't going to be the education governor. He wasn't interested in education and he's lived up to that. Uh, very, <laughs> I, I mean, he's cut K through 12 last year by a billion dollars. He's cut uh, all the higher education institutions and, and pieces significantly. He's clearly not invested in, in education uh, as, as a matter of policy. And as you hear someone like uh, former Senator Santorum uh, campaigning for the Republican nomination and saying, well, you know, it's anachronistic to have public, uh, public education yeah. at all. That's all homeschool and we'll all be, you know, that's the way to go. Yeah. I mean, you wonder how much of that kind of thinking is going on in the Corbett administration. Uh, we don't need to fund public education. We can all just make everybody pay for it or we can do it at home and we'll be fine because you remember the good old days before the Civil War when that worked so well for us and we all lived in log cabins and so on and so we forth. Could, we could but do that, a whole show on this. Uh, uh, we, 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 <laughs> on we could do a, on, on, on the po politics and <laughs> yeah. the policies. Of, of, but, yeah, there may be a bit of that, but I think simply, it, it's simple nuts and bolts is it's a it's a matter of what's discretionary in the in the budget, and that's right. uh, and he he's unwilling to make the hard policy choices to go elsewhere. Well, there's a, a difference, I guess, too, that perhaps our, our viewers need to understand that you could um, uh, sh illustrate perhaps very well, Steve, and that is there's a big difference talking about cuts in the state-related funding and the state system of higher education funding because, I guess, for example, in Penn State, when the governor last year was calling for a 50 percent in cut for Penn State, state assistance to Penn State amounted to 8% of their budget. So what he was calling for was a 4% in the total cut to all of Penn State's budget and they only lost 2%. But when you're talking about a 54% cut to the state system, that's uh, much different. The, right. the funding stream uh, is far different, isn't it? I right. Mean, it's a much more well, of an impact. Well, there, there are several, several pieces to that, to that Charlie. Um, Let's start with just the, the mere size uh, of the, uh, the two elements. Uh, as you said, uh, Penn State says a, a year ago that 8% of their budget came from the state appropriation. Uh, the state system, Pashi, says about 30% of their budget comes from the, the state appropriation. So if you're cutting them both 50%, it obviously, it has a lot bigger impact on the uh, state system than it does on Penn State. Yes. The other side of it is Penn State has a, a culture and a series of schools because of the research type institution they are. They have an engineering school, they have a law school, they have a med center, all of which gener has, means you have alumni who write bigger checks. Mm -hmm. The size of the foundation at Penn State is huge. And one of the, you know, the macabre jokes of last spring was, well, so what, the state's cutting it. You know, uh, Graham Spanier probably has many phone calls within a day of people saying, I'll, I'll write you a check to make up for that because they have that kind of fundraising at, at Penn State. They have that kind of brand recognition. They have that kind of people who, who step forward and write those kinds of checks. And uh, the state system does not have that same level of, of foundation and, and support because that's not the kind of graduates, uh, we, we don't have those kinds of schools amongst our 14. We educate uh, working class and middle class Pennsylvanians to become, 
you know, middle class citizens, you know, school teachers or health professionals. And, uh, you know, we don't have a law school and we don't have a med center. Uh, so we don't have engineering schools. So uh, we, we don't have any of those super professional type to, to tap into. So it is not, not only is it the appropriations a bigger percentage, but the kind of culture we can draw on for, for extra funding is a very different thing. Okay. We'll be right back with the second half of this, and we have uh, a lot of uh, very uh, good questions coming up for Steve in the second half. We'll be right back to you. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions that make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. By the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Express, transporting construction, farm, and industrial equipment throughout the United States. And by Penn Waste, your best local choice for your waste removal and recycling needs. Penn Waste is proud to be a locally owned business. Since the company's founding in 2000, it has employed many of its neighbors as members of a dedicated team of professionals. Penn Waste is proud of its many contributions to the people of its service area through support of numerous community organizations such as Christmas Addicts and the Junior League of York. One more way they improve the quality of life where they live and work. Welcome back to the second half of Behind the Headlines. We have Steve Hicks here, the president of ABSCUF, with us, and we're talking about higher education. Mark? Yes. Well, Steve, we, you know, we, we talked about the governor's proposed budget, so we go from the proposal into budget hearing time with it in the General Assembly. Yes. Then we go on to negotiating the budget, and hopefully by June 30th it's all settled. Right. So there's a little bit of time between now and then. What's your strategy? How are you going to get the word out about, you know, how devastating this would be? to the state system. Right. Well, you know, the good news is we, we, we had a test run last year, so we, we got to do things and, and we learned a lot from last year. But I, I think it's a, a at least a two-part strategy. One is you have to do some work here in Harrisburg because, you know, we're, we're a block or two from the Capitol and you have to go in there and, and twist arms there. But you also have to ha have a strategy back. We have 14 campuses in 14 mostly Republican districts. And, and we have to make noise there. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do, we're going to have rallies both here and on the campuses over the course of the next, as you say, three months. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also going to run several uh, you know, media campaigns uh, to, to, you know, get something. Raise in, awareness. Uh, ra yeah. Raise yeah. awareness, but yeah. also uh, to, you know, last year we had a very effective postcard campaign. I think we ended up collecting 10,000 postcards and giving them to legislators. And I think we're going to do more of that so that they, they have something in their hand that says, my constituents are upset about this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's probably going to say something on it to them about, you know, restore our funding, take care of us, you know, those sorts of messages. So we're going to do that sort of thing. Because what we learned a year ago uh, very uh, emphatically is that this is a civics lesson. The governor doesn't get to make the budget. He gets to make a proposal. Right. And both the House and the Senate then get to mm -hmm. craft it. Oh, and they may have along. different opinions yeah. about how it works. And based on uh, last year, it was pretty clear that even the Republicans in the House and Senate weren't on board with the notion that higher ed uh, needed cutting in the state. And I recall you had a lot of students involved last year in your grassroots effort. And uh, we, we, at various, you, you know, we had about a thousand students here one day right. on the Capitol steps. Mm -hmm. We had. Uh, hundreds at various campuses on various different days. So yes, we, we probably had, you know, 10,000 students at least involved at one time or another Good. over the course of the spring. And we're hoping, well, the early indication is we're going to have those kinds of numbers again this year because we have the social media in place. Uh, ABSCUF has a website, uh, PennsylvaniaStudentVoice.org, 
where students can go to to get information. So we're much more organized this year, and we've already had students setting up rallies on campuses. And they actually did one last week at Lock Haven, which uh, the theme was the death of higher education in Pennsylvania, where they carried a casket across campus <laughs> and wore black. <laughs> you know, it, but so we have people being very creative and, and sending out strong messages that say, say that, you know, and I, I don't think there's any way anybody can say that death is a good thing. So yeah. it, it's yeah. uh, uh, giving you that, n that negative message of what the, this could lead to. Would you repeat the name of that website, Steve? Uh, PAstudentsvoice.org. Okay. I just uh -huh. want to make sure that our, our viewers have a chance to take a look at that if they'd like. Uh, if the governor's proposal would be adopted, what effect would that have on student tuition and the ability of Pennsylvania uh, low and moderate income families to send their children to uh, higher ed? Well, that's th that's the painful part of this. Uh, last year, because we, you know we had to model out last year, and it's hard to predict the future. But last year's 18 percent cut at the at the end led to a seven and a half percent increase in tuition, which was about six hundred dollars. Uh, per year, and uh, this year, you, when you're looking at 20 20 percent, if they filled in the whole gap, you know your simple math is it'd be a 13 percent uh, tuition increase, which is another 800 dollars. And people ask, what were the effects? Well, a simple effect was based on uh, the numbers out of the chancellor's office. We had fewer students in the fall, mm -hmm. and I, I spoke with the chancellor yesterday, and based on their you know early uh, you know, talks informal and not the uh, pers you know they don't have the numbers in front of them but we're down in the spring that uh, more students than normal did not come back this spring mm -hmm. and uh, you know you have to think that the cost is a big factor we're already uh, borrowing too much money uh, our students average twenty three thousand dollars worth of debt when they graduate and if you look at private institutions in the Commonwealth what people have borrowed they're in the 20s too so it's not that big a difference from being at a private institution to being at one of our institutions because we we deal with a different demographic people who don't have tens of thousands of dollars salted away to pay for their college education and we have people you know doing part-time jobs to get through and you know when you raise tuition eight hundred dollars that's tough when you're working part-time to fill in that hole. Well, in, in addition to tuition, um, impact on tuition, what sort of impact would it, would it have on the economic growth of Pennsylvania to, rate, to to have these kind of cuts? Well, you know, short term, who knows, but uh, all these think tanks in the Obama administration keep talking about how if we're going to stay competitive or get competitive internationally, we have to produce more degrees than we've been producing. Uh, we used to have the highest percentage of degree holders in, in the world. We, we've slumped down to where we're, we're, you know, 15th or something, and we're supposed to produce, uh, well, the state is supposed to produce 50 percent more uh, degrees or two-year to four-year degrees in, by 2020. Well, defunding higher education is not a way to generate more, more degrees, to get more people in the doors. We're, we're going the opposite direction. So the long-term economic impact looks to be that we're going to go back to being a third world country. That we're going to live with jobs like, we, you know, Walmart, you know, everybody uses Walmart and, and uh, bless them, but, you know, lo low, low wage jobs that uh, aren't sustaining, not, not quality middle class jobs. And, and as a commonwealth, we seem to be willing to cede to other states that uh, the higher education in a, in a highly educated workforce. We're 45th in the country per capita in investment in higher education. Mm. And, you know, the governor's proposal is pushing us more towards 50th than it is to move us up and make us competitive because New York, New Jersey, Maryland, uh, Delaware, these places are going to keep investing in higher education and keep getting businesses to come in with the quality jobs. And uh, the short term, we, we're cutting higher education uh, policy that we're looking at looks to have a very negative long-term impact. We, we lost 150 faculty members from the fall of 2010 to the fall of 2011. Uh, you have to think that that's somewhat budget driven and that also means a lot of high quality jobs leaving very small communities. Uh, you know, three of our institutions are the biggest employer in their county. 
So when you start, you know, cutting those budgets, you're go also going to have an economic impact locally. You know, uh, pizza shops and uh, beer distributors and coffee shops are all going, you, you go and they feel have a tough some time. Pain. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you have you have fewer pay Student people sustaining making. Sustaining uh, entities. You have entities. fewer <laughs> students. You have fewer faculty. You you know, the state system uh, proudly trumpeted in their message the day after the budget address say, saying that they'd cut 900 jobs in the last two years. Well, you, you think of those 14 communities and those lost jobs, that's, that's lost, uh, yeah. you know, wallets going into places mm -hmm. buying, you know, whatever services. So you, there's going to be some local impact too. Steve, in the last minute that we have here, the governor also called for the creation of a higher education advisory panel. And the interesting thing about the composition of that panel, uh, when I took a look at it, is number one, I'm surprised you're not on it. Number well, two, thank you. there mm -hmm. is no member of labor who is on that particular panel. Now, I don't know what the right percentages should be uh, for representation on that panel, but shouldn't the people that actually do some of the teaching be represented on that panel, Steve? Well, yeah, I, I think. Uh, if the governor had asked me, I would have thought that the faculty uh, from public institutions should have been on there. There are about 20,000 faculty members from in public institutions that could have had a lot of quality input. Since one of the th th charges of the advisory panel is to determine what we're going to do in the future in terms of programs, to not have somebody who's in the trenches educating at one of the public institutions seems to be a major flaw in the governor's uh, design of that panel. I mean, it should seem like all the stakeholders uh, to this discussion should have a seat at the table. And you I would, would think, think that Well, and there, there is, there, there's no public education and pu public higher ed student on the, on the panel either, which is amazing considering they're going to talk about uh, costs as well as programs. You would think you'd want some student input too. Okay. Well, again, we wish to thank you for being with us, for shedding some light on this very important issue, and uh, we will hope, look to uh, have you back in the near future yeah. to keep updating us on I'd this. I'd be state. glad to come back. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank All you right. very much. We'll be back with you again next week with a new program on Behind the Headlines. Maura and I will see you then. Behind the Headlines is a production of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization helping Pennsylvania build a brighter future.